doing? Uh, this is a, a video I'm making up for my grandson. His name is Weston, who's put in a request to, uh, to see the GP35 that we just acquired. For uh, He wants to see it go and everything, so I figured I'd do a little above and beyond uh, just making it go. We're going to do a little review on it and... Uh, and Weston is four years old, so uh, I'm gonna. Uh, if it seems like I'm doing this for a four-year-old, that's basically what it is. But uh, it's, he's. I might want to note that he's not your ordinary four-year-old. He's pretty intelligent. Uh, I'm not sure who he gets that from. But uh, also, we've got. Uh, if you're not interested in the train thing, whatever, we got JJ along for the ride here, the Blue Crown Conure that might entertain uh, those other ones. And uh, I'd like to also put a shout out to uh, my granddaughter Elise, who is uh, two years old, and I'm sure she'll be watching this and entertained with it as well, because they like to see Papa on TV. So, anyway, a little background about myself for the rest of you. Um, I'm 60 years old. I'm retired from the railroad industry. Um, I worked there for 30 years. Started when I was 20 years old. Um, but my railroading uh, started long before I started uh, there, actually, when I was Weston's age. I acquired my first train set, which is down here in the box, uh, the Lionel Old General, five-star General with Magna Traction Super O Track, and it's in the box ready to, we're going to take it to uh, Weston's house, which is 120, we live 120 miles away, and uh, that's another reason for making the video as well, as we get a little quality time here uh, uh, via YouTube. So, and on this video, uh, I don't have anybody behind the camera, so I'm going to have to check it once in a while. Um, this is where the railroading started in 1960, approximately, possibly 61. I was born in 56, so I was about four or five years old when I got this at Christmas time. Uh, I'd like to appreciation to my father for making sure this thing got boxed up after every Christmas when we'd set it up and then uh, uh, I did build some layouts over the years and acquire some more and I currently do have a O gauge layout around the wall here and uh, that's where it started and this is where it's at now we got uh, in the model railroading side of it we got this this Christmas it's today is January the 10th 2017 so this locomotive is a uh, GP 35 high hood um, back to the real railroading career which started at age 20 in 1976 I started with Conrail in the maintenance away department which uh, um, most of you will know as uh, the track construction department track department I worked in the track construction department for 15 of those 30 years and the other 15 uh, just to round things out was spent in the locomotive shop um, with uh, the Willing and Lake Erie Railway. I went to uh, the Willing and Lake Erie Railway in 1991 a few months after they started up because uh, Conrail uh, the trying to hold a, a job in the track department there became very difficult because of the uh, the government was not uh, subsidizing it as much and it was about to become privatized as it is today. So Conrail was made up, Weston, of uh, a bunch of railroads that uh, had run, they were running out of money and they didn't manage the railroads that well. The companies, the Pennsylvania Railroad, Penn Central, New York Central, Erie Lackawanna, and uh, some other ones. Uh, were all bunched together by the taking over by the federal government, um, by our government to keep them going because it was necessary to keep these railroads going and it was called Conrail and that's short for Consolidated Rail Corporation. So anyway, that's where I got my start in the real railroading world 
and uh, I finished out with the Whittling and Lake Erie Railway. Now on up here today, the reason I have this and it was given to me for a Christmas gift this year is because this was uh, the most common railroad that the Willing and Lake Erie had in their fleet. Uh, the GP35 High Hood locomotive. Um, the High Hood part I want to point out to you it makes this a very rare and not very sought after or liked by the engineers uh, locomotive. There's Most of the GP35s are um, low hood meaning the you see how this hood is clear up over here most of them the hood is cut off down here it's low so with a windshield it goes all the way across we get this out here where we can see it I would like to also point out that uh, this model locomotive is just very impressive awesomely impressive as far as built by Atlas um, and the detail that they put into this thing is just phenomenal and I'm going to point some of that a lot of that detail out to you here so this look of this model built by Atlas O gauge GP 35 diesel locomotive high nose item number 1116 Willing and Lake Erie three rail it's a TMCC exclusive for Peterson Supply Company engine number 103 now in the model railroading world Weston much like in the real railroading locomotive world there are two main companies in the model railroading world there's Lionel which built the old general that I got when I was four years old and then there's the other company which is MTH and they are both have different controllers and dis different systems completely different systems just like in the real world here's the MTH controller okay so you can remotely control it and here is the one of the Lionel controllers which is called the TMCC system and two completely different systems two different companies in the real railroad world there's two different companies there's a company that made this which is General Motors and the General Motors has a special locomotive part of the company division um, called EMD and that's their their uh, logo right there so General Motors the other company that makes the other locomotives that you commonly see is GE General Electric okay now, what I was saying about the high hood part about this GP35, the engineers, they did not like this. And it's very understandable why, because they couldn't see. Of course, the engineer always sits on the right side of the locomotive, which is uh, would be over here. And the conductor or brakeman, whoever's riding with him, you know, sits on that side. But so if he's sitting here looking out this windshield he's got this window to look out of the side window to look out of but he cannot see across this way like when he's going to a crossing or where cars are crossing you know on the highway look to see if there's cars coming he can't see he's blindsided he cannot see anything over here he's got this big blind spot on a low hood low nose gp35 <music> the front of it's cut off right here and the roof just goes you know you don't have this high section and then you have windshields going across there where and he could actually get up stand up and and see out those windshields a little bit he has a whole lot more visibility but this locomotive visibility is very limited for the engineer
very rarely will you see one locomotive by itself on a train. And the reason for that, one reason is for that, is because when a train gets where it's going and the time to come back, there's usually not a turntable anywhere to turn it. There's only two ways to turn a locomotive. That's on a Y track or on a turntable. So they put another locomotive on the other, coupled up to this locomotive that's pointing the other way so that the engineer just you know gets off of this one and and the crew walk around and get in the other one and now pointing the other way even if they don't need the the extra horsepower to pull uh they'll have another locomotive coupled up tail to tail and when two locomotives are coupled up together that's called a consist so if you see more than one locomotive coupled together you call it a consist or in the model railroading world they refer to it as a, a lash up so, so um, and there are reasons they put multiple locomotives together other than what I just said so they can go the other direction but they also uh, when there's more than two, then you know they need them for the horsepower, for the pulling power, to pull the train, the heavy train. So sometimes they'll have uh, three, four locomotives uh, latch, lashed up together to pull the train. Now, on the front of this locomotive, of course, we have the bell and the horn up here, but the the detail that I want some of it on point out. You see right here, this little cap right here, that's the sand dome. That's where you put the sand in the locomotive. And down inside here, there's a sand box. And there's the same thing at the other end of the locomotive. There's a sand dome. That's just a little cap, a lid that flips open. And you, uh, we would stand on top and pull a, a hose down from the sand tower and put sand in these things and fill them up. That's part of servicing the locomotive as well as fueling them up and checking the oil and all that stuff. Um, let me see if I can get a picture better of the sand dome for you, the top of this thing. Right here is the sand. The sand cap right there. And you see the horns right here. Okay, and there's the grab irons right here. These grab irons is for you'd have to crawl up these steps right here on the front of it to get up on top of the locomotive. All right, also the detail that's on this thing. These little things right here that'll light up when you put it on the track are class lights, called class lights on this. I don't know what they were originally used for. I always thought they they represented what class of track, what class of train you were. But uh, on this locomotive, they light up red when you have the direction in the uh, other way. Say if I was going backwards, this end, the class lights would light up red. And uh, when you're going forward this way, when the headlight's on this way, you're going forward, these would be off. They wouldn't light up. But uh, I know on the real world locomotives, they had a couple different colors in the class lights. We didn't use them by this time, but I think it was something that uh, somebody else could probably tell us what the class lights really represented. That's always been kind of a mystery to me. Now we'll keep stay with the front of the GP35 here about what we have here. Okay, so now here you see this chain right here, all right? That is stretched across there for safety so that if somebody's walking through here, they're not going to um, fall off the front of the locomotive, basically. Because when the locomotive's moving, there's a lot of jerking motion and everything. And even if it's, 
not moving. Uh, sometimes you get bumped by other locomotives getting tied onto it when you're working the service track. But this chain, the reason it's a chain there instead of a, a bar like you have here, these, gra these are called grab irons. Uh, because when you make a consist together, if you couple this locomotive up to another one, you would take this chain and unhook it from here and hook it onto the other locomotive, and the other locomotive would have a chain of, on its uh, grab irons as well that would hook up here. So then, then you would lower this walkway platform. Look at the detail on this thing. It's just this is another one. It's, this walkway platform. It, the only thing it's missing is the latch to hook it so it doesn't fall down on its own. Which, okay, but then you look, and these two match up, and that way you could walk from this locomotive to the next locomotive. And let's say you had four or five locomotives hooked together, you can get from the front locomotive all the way to the back locomotive without having to get on the ground while they were moving. You can get to walk around to get from locomotive to locomotive. Sometimes you need to do that. Sometimes the conductor or whatever will be riding back in the other locomotive for whatever reason. So.